approach our current world situation um, personally? How do we manage the intensity of what's going on um, with practices that we all have access to so that we can all mount, manage and balance our inspiration so that we can remember what we're doing this all for, our healing or integration so that we can mend ourselves and each other as we go, and our connection because none of us are an island and we need to pull this off together. This work comes from a couple of books uh, that I've written over the last four or five years. In fact, came to the first Harvest uh, Festival to share Stealing Fire and then back again this time to share the kind of continuation of this work. But, but fundamentally, I've been amazingly, well, I've been very curious about what is the nature of transformative and transformational cultures. So through history, you know, from the ancient Greeks to now, uh, contemporary expressions, as well as what are the sort of, what's the neuroanthropology of how we do this human thing? You know, not only what is the history of it, the kind of culture, but also what's the neuroscientific explanation for why these things work the way they do? So um, as I said, we will be going into some more detail on Saturday and some in, in a keynote conversation about this, but just to kind of level set, at least why I'm here and why I imagine many of us are, which is, the first thing is, is as we all know, maybe all too well, um, we're in a tight spot globally. And not just on a single thing, like economics or politics or environment, you know, or culture, but on all the things. And technically that's known as the meta-crisis, meaning it's just a bunch of them happening together. And the bulletin of atomic scientists who have that well-known doomsday clock that they started in 1946 to kind of track how close civilization is to snuffing it, now reads 100 seconds to midnight. It's the closest it's ever been, including the Cuban Missile Crisis and all the, you know, all the ups and downs of the Cold War. And at the same time that that's happening, we're also in a meaning crisis, right? We've lost access to our trusted landmarks. Organized religions are no longer informing how most of us make sense of the world or tell us how to do or who to be or, or how to live or what we ought to do. And also, as we've been experiencing since 2008 to now, a kind of a, a collapse in the neoliberal order. The idea that we used to look to academic institutions and science and transnational organizations like NGOs, like the WHO, like the CDC, all these things are eroding in ways that leave us more adrift than perhaps at any other time in history. So here we are at a time where we're increasingly aware we need to be at our best and we're actually showing up at our worst, right? We're getting fractured and split by tribalism and by identity politics. And these things are making it harder and harder for us to get together to do the things we need to do on behalf of our children and their children. So this is really the situation, right? As we've been seeing on studies of everything from climactic global shifts to the distribution of microplastics <laughs> to global instabilities, as the American founding father, Benjamin Franklin said, at the signing of the Declaration of Independence, right? So none of those guys wanted to be the first ones to sign that thing because the moment they signed it, their name was on it and they were going to be subject to treason if the American Revolution didn't work. And so he finally, Ben Franklin, stood up and he said, gentlemen, I understand your reservations, but of one thing I am certain, we must all hang together or we shall assuredly hang separately. So that's where we are and the question becomes, how do we do this? How do we find distributed, scalable, accessible tools for healing, inspiration, and connection so that we can all get here? And I think Buckminster Fuller, the famous futurist, designer of geodesic domes and all sorts of fantastic things way ahead of his time, uh, put it this way. He said, how can we, so our project, you know, is how can we make the world work for 100% of humanity, everybody, in the shortest possible time, through spontaneous cooperation without ecological offense or the disadvantage of anyone. So if we're okay with that as the setting and the context for what we're about to jump into. So 
into this mix, uh, I was interviewing some folks from the Harvard Sacred Design Lab, who were basically, this is at Harvard Divinity School, and they are, their curiosity is fundamentally what does belief look like in a postmodern age, in an age moving beyond just established traditions and into this kind of era where everybody gets to sort of make, make up our worldviews as we go. And they came up with something really interesting. They said, hey, look, there was a moment, 20th century, early 21st century, where people thought that the end of faith, this is Christopher Hitchens, this is Sam Harris, it's those kind of folks known as the new atheists, they said, hey, this is actually a good thing. Where people are stepping out of superstitious obedience to sky gods and priests, right? But then they miss something. They miss something, and that thing was is that people who believe around the world are generally healthier, wealthier, and happier than people who don't believe. And what's really interesting is it doesn't matter what god you believe in. It could be Buddha, it could be Krishna, it could be Jesus, it could be Allah, right? It's not what you believe, it's that you believe. And that you do it in a community of practice. And so they came up with these three sort of essential nutrients that faith offers us, which is beyond some sense of awe, some sense of the ineffable, becoming some sense of healing and growth, and belonging, some sense of connection to a community beyond our isolated selves, right? So if you put that into kind of, you know, parallel language, it's healing, inspiration, and connection. So if we need that at a global level, it would make sense that we have to learn how to practice it at the personal level, right? And one of the simplest ways to do that is in our embodiment and through our sexuality. So this is the kind of transition into the specifics of today. But as we do that, I'd love to get a kind of, a, we're going to do a quick straw poll. Need to know who we're talking to here, all right? This is a beautiful global polyglot audience with people coming from all over the world, from all sorts of different backgrounds, faiths, practices. So what I'd like to do is just kind of identify there are three broad personality types as to how we relate to this content and this information. Fundamentally, it's the hedonist, the conformist, and the purist. Okay, so I'm just going to go through these one at a time. The hedonist is the sensation seeker. Right? They want to suck the marrow out of life. The conformist is the rule follower. The purist is the identity protector. Okay, so we're going to quiz you guys, actually, by the way. So pay attention to which one feels most like you. Their catchphrase for the hedonist is, if it feels good, do it, man. The conformist might say, well, if it's what the doctor ordered, then I'll do it. Right? And the purist, my body is my temple. Uh-huh, yep. Missing link. Now, now, everybody, you know, all of these are beautiful expressions of our choices and our lived experience, but on the other hand, they all have their strengths and weaknesses. So the weakness or the missing link for the hedonist is breaks. They're really good at just going off the cliff at 100 miles an hour, no skid marks, right? The conformist, their, their missing link is steering. They tend to get stuck in the ruts of consensus opinion and just trundle along because that's the way the road goes. And for the purist, it's gas. Quite often they might think that their breath work or their mindfulness or their yoga practice is all they ever need, and they don't need to dabble in any of those other things. Right? So that we can see already how there's some limitations here. Substances of choice. For the hedonist, it's cocaine, champagne, and reefer. For the conformist, it's ambient Adderall and alcohol. Right? Anything that is prescribed, sanctioned, street legal, never mind the horrendous side effects. You could throw in clonopin, you could throw in a whole host of medications that we now know are often linked to iatrogenic illness, which is just a fancy way of saying your doctor made you sicker. Right? But because it's sanctioned, people go through that without thinking twice. They, they raise their children on amphetamines, right? Adderall, Ritalin. No question, like, hmm, what are the long-term neurological effects of wiring a human up on speed for their entire life? Never mind, the doctor said so. And the purest wheatgrass, elixirs, cacao, pa-pow. So the Achilles heel for the hedonist 
is addiction. No surprise. Could be sexual, could be chemical, could be anything that it is. It's just riding the potty train, seeking sensations to the point where they cannot back off. For the conformist, their Achilles heel is compliance. Like, just because it was what was supposed to happen, I'm doing it. And I'm not assessing this for myself. And the purest is pride. Right? I literally, that back to that, my body is my temple. And, and the Tibetan teacher Chogyam Trungpa t- talked about this. He said, be careful of spiritual materialism. Right? That idea that the very practices I choose to get rid of my ego are actually just buffing and polishing and spotlighting my ego even further. So if you've ever seen those uppity bastards at yoga and meditation retreats, you now have a term for it, right? So the resistance, what might prevent these folks from actually opening up into something more, something more expansive? The first thing that a hedonist will say is, you're not the boss of me, right? I'm going to do my own thing, man. I'm a rebel, right? The conformist might ask themselves, but who would I be if I did that, right? It's the whole looking, it's what would the neighbors think? What would my family think? and then coming back into consensus land. And for the purist, it's anything that I'm not already doing is cheating. I don't need those crutches. I get high naturally, right? So we can kind of see that. But, right, so we've just kind of mapped the psychographics, right? How does it look from each, within each of these worldviews? But each of them also has a really vital core value. Right? And for the hedonist, it's seeking the fullest range of life to be had. That's the sucking the marrow out of it, leaving no stone unturned. I don't want to die wondering. So the hedonist goes on a search and destroy mission. The conformist has the value of, I really value evidence, science, research, professional opinion. Right? There are smarter, better informed people than me, and I'm going to defer to them. And the purest values sanctity of mind and body. Okay, so now we're going to do the pop quiz. Raise all the hedonists. Self-identify. Raise your hands. Raise them high and proud. Look around. Spot these folks for late night. They'll be the ones holding. All right? Conformists. Conformists. The folks who value the advice of evidence and experts. Beautiful, thank you. And lastly, in a landslide, I'm betting the purists. No, wow, the hedonists beat the stuffing out of you guys. And then let's just see undecideds. Who was undecided? Okay, well, beautiful. Well, here's a fourth way, right? What happens if we actually embody all three of those things, right? Can we become hedonic engineers, which is what Robert Anton Wilson called, he said, hedonic engineering is the process of intelligence studying itself to become more intelligent. Why be depressed, dumb, and agitated when you can be smart, tranquil, and happy? So that's, that's the inquiry. How do we become hedonic engineers? So this is the story for today. I um, want to tell it in three parts, with the first is which is evolution is amoral. And that might be obvious as soon as we go through it and unpack that, but it's really important for us to understand what is in our evolutionary biological encoding and how, at times, radically and painfully different those impulses are from our values, from our dreams, from our goals, from our relationships and norms. The next is humans are exceptional. Not necessarily in the way we would think that we're the cleverest monkeys on the planet, but we are actually highly atypical when it comes to sexuality, reproduction, and consciousness in the animal kingdom. And really understanding that is important because we just tend to take how we live and how we love and how we generate generations of other humans as normative. But actually, we are the weird ones in the animal kingdom. And then finally... Once we understand those two things, we can conduct studies and research, right, to shed light on how do we hack evolution? How do we take the reins back from something that is arguably the cause of much of our suffering and use it for the healing, inspiration, and connection we've been discussing? So the first thing is this. So this is about um, sexuality in the animal kingdom. And some of you, this will date me, but it might 
remind some of you. In 1999, the Bloodhound Gang released a novelty song, Bad Touch, that went where anthropologists and psychologists were afraid to go. Their catchy lyrics put human courtship back within the broader context of love in the animal kingdom. The tune struck a chord, rocking, rocketing to the top 10 charts worldwide and getting sampled by the rapper Eminem. You and me, baby, ain't nothing but mammals. Let's do it like they do on the Discovery Channel. <laughs> Getting horny now. But really, the Bloodhound Gang should have watched a little more Discovery Channel before they penned their pickup lines. After all, have you seen how animals have sex? It's brutal. Ducks practically drown each other in their efforts. The male mounts the female, wings beating, crushing her underwater until the deed is done. Leave the cooing to the turtle doves. Ducks, fuck. Dogs hump frantically but can get tied up and twisted on the dismount. Stuck, f stuck facing backwards for hours, they have to wait sheepishly until the swelling goes down and they can both be on their way. But the big cats, the cats have it maybe worst of all. Lions, for instance, only mate every couple of years in the wild. When they do, they make up for lost time copulating up to 50 times in a 24-hour window. And it's not because they like it. The male's penis has over a hundred tiny barbs on it, which gouge the vaginal walls of the lioness. The spikes serve two purposes, to scrape out any competing semen from prior males and to stimulate ovulation in the female. Fun comes in a distant third. So it's not just the animals that are subject to those impulses and conditions. And this is, this is work taken from Kinsey researcher and Match.com's chief scientist, uh, Dr. Helen Fisher. But if you basically think of our lives and what we describe as love and relationship, it's actually broken into three separate categories, each of which progresses and leads from the other, and each of which is responsible for pretty much our lived experience of love from Greek tragedies to Shakespeare to TikTok. And once we understand that, we can realize what is evolution doing to us and why. So in the beginning, when we feel like we're falling into love, it's actually a very strong lust imprint. This is just simply biological urge or instinct to mate, predominantly driven by our hormonal endocrine system, testosterone and estrogen. Now, most folks will think testosterone is for guys, estrogen is for women, but actually women also have testosterone. And this is the strong impulse simply to copulate, right? This is as basic and primal as it gets. As we move from that phase into some form of, you know, early romance, we actually get into that attraction phase. And that has dopamine, which is secreted during and immediately after orgasm. So that creates this amazing, like, wow, this is novel. This is fantastic. This feels great. Um, norepinephrine, a sort of a stimulating arousal. And actually, it, you know, un, unintuitively, serotonin, which if you think about Prozac and you think of depression and those kind of models of, of, of psychiatric illness, right, actually serotonin plummets. And if you've ever tried to corral a teenager or been one yourself and they suddenly stop making sense and they're obsessed with their new love and they're sneaking out of bedroom windows and doing all sorts of batshit crazy things, some scientists think that it actually, you know, that early onset of love and attraction is closest to OCD. Right? It's literally a sort of neurochemically induced mental imbalance designed to pair those people no matter what. And then finally, if you make it to that third phase, you get the attachment of oxytocin, vasopressin, long-term pair bonding. But here's the point about evolution and its morality, is it doesn't have any. All it cares about is creating the mo most robust gene pool possible. So if we think about the seven-year itch, I mean, basically all these magic of the first two, which is typically what we think of as love, is only switched on for three to four or five years, after which it just plummets. And that's precisely long enough to conceive, gestate, and wean a small child. And after that, Mother Nature is whispering in our ears to take another turn at the roulette wheel. Right? If you think of women who are on hormonal birth control, 
right? They have high estrogen, abnormally, you know, for, for their system, they have artificially boosted estrogen in their system, and they will, they will mate select for a sweet, kind father to hopefully produce a stable home and household. And then the dirty trick is quite often they will find that sweet, kind guy. They will say, let, you know, he will propose. They'll say, let's get married. They get married. She's like, okay, I'm going to go off the pill now. Let's start trying to get have a family. And then suddenly she's like, wait a second. Who's this milk toast wiener? I want to find a strong jawed, burly, Harley biker guy, right? Let me go and let me go and find him. And when women are ovulating, right, once a month, they actually become increasingly dissatisfied with long-term partners. They don't like their smell, they don't like their mannerisms, they don't like the way they talk, and actually they are strongly incented. I see lots of shit-eating grins in the audience, by the way. Thank you for the feedback, right? <laughs> and they are highly incented to go out and find a new lover. And when they do, if they have an orgasm with a novel lover, their ovulation cycle can slide either direction up to 72 additional hours. So Mother Nature is like, oh yes, fresh meat, fresh blood, high testosterone, mate availability, let's make him a baby daddy. <laughs> Men, on the other hand, surprise, surprise, also fall in something which the French, you know, the French, the, the masters of all things amorous, have a, have a beautiful language for it, la fer de la quarantaine, which is literally the affair of the 40s. Like, predictable, they even have a name for it. And what it comes down to is that just about the age of 40, plus or minus, most men will experience a drop in testosterone. Their bodies start sagging into dad, dad bog land. They don't get up as much. They don't have as stiff an erections. They take longer to recover after workouts. And they're like, oh my gosh, I think I need to get a tribal tattoo and a Porsche convertible. <laughs> and maybe run off with the secretary, right? Because, because once again, Right? One of the surest fire spikes to midlife testosterone in males is, wouldn't you, wouldn't you know it, sex with a newer, younger partner. So you're like, oh my gosh, the dude could have just got a testosterone patch and saved a really expensive divorce, right? Because after he's had that shag, he's like, oh, wait a second, what have I done? Wait, like, I, I, you know, like, I'm Nintendo, she's Xbox. Like, I'm a vintage cab, she's a fireball shooter, right? What do I, I, she doesn't get my movie references. They're, her friends are really, really lame. What are we doing? But by that time, boom, right? His life is in ruins, and wouldn't you know it, he's probably got a second family on the way himself. Poor bastard. So we can just see, right? I mean, this is the humor, this is the tragic comedy of our lives. Right? And then throw in the much more serious things. Throw in, just think about the world of conflict. Think about war and think about rapes. Think about infidelity. Think about pregnancies, planned, you know, terminated, planned or unplanned. Think about jealousy. Think about all of these things and realize that none of this has to do with what we want out of our love and relationships. And it has everything to do with what evolution wants, which is just a robust gene pool, damn the consequences. So these, the, these, you know, this is where it goes wrong, right? Lust can become overwhelm, right? It can become adultery, jealousy, right? It can become all of these things that wreck our lives, all the way back to Helen of Troy, right? Think about that, the face that launched a thousand ships. And think of the destruction that came from all that. So can we just pause for a moment and just kind of like let that sink in? Think, you can make a case that well over half of human tragedy, grief, and suffering comes from the cross-wiring and the misalignment of our sexual impulse to reproduce and our own beliefs, values, and relationships. So there is a chance here for us to do something else. So I'd love to just read you. This is actually, by the way, this is um, one of the founders of neuroscience, Wilder Penfield's model. This is what he called a homunculus, which is a little freaky, freaky dude. But if you see him, right, he basically drew this um, to reflect where are the greatest neuronal concentrations, so nerve endings in our body. So if we drew a human based on where we actually have the most sensations and feelings, this is what Wilder Penfield did, but this was, you know, actually, it's not quite right, right? Because if it, was, if it was anatomically correct, his junk would be enormous, 
And a woman would be even more. So a man has roughly 7,000 nerve endings on the end of his penis. A woman has 8,000 nerve endings on her clitoris, right? Tongues, we don't, you know, mouths, lips, and tongues are huge. Hands and feet, you know, tons of sensory neuronal elements. But what that means is we actually um, are highly, highly unusual compared to all of the other animals. So I'd love to just kind of read a section to unpack that for you guys. That's what's so fascinating about our own sexual habits, how thoroughly different they are from those mammals on the Discovery Channel. All these features of human sexuality, long-term sexual partnerships, private sex, concealed ovulation, extended female receptivity, sex for fun, constitutes what we humans assume is normal sexuality, anthropologist Jared Diamond explains. But that proves to be a speciesist interpretation. By the standards of the world's 43,000 other species, mammals, even by the standards of our own, sorry, 43,000 mammals, even by the standards of our own closest relatives, the great apes, we are the ones who are bizarre. We're among only a handful of animals on the entire planet who have sex outside of a narrowly defined window of fertility. Sure, dolphins and bonobos do sometimes, but they're two of the most intelligent species on the planet. Their friskiness only strengthens the linkage between elective sexuality and complex cognition. But even they lack many of the other factors that render human sexuality so distinctive, like concealed ovulation and frequent female orgasm. Animals ignore their sex drives until they are briefly consumed by them. But humans think and act on their impulse anytime, all the time. Most women, unless they're on the pill or using a fertility app, do not know for certain when they are in estrus, a simple fact of life that cows and baboons readily understand. Men definitely can't tell when their potential mates are ovulating and experience high sex drive and a desire to copulate year-round. Women mostly humor them. So this is it, right? Think about it. If we were to tell a kind of a just-so story to kids at bedtime, you're like, hey, kids, guess what? Out there in the animal kingdom, there's a species, and the male and the female of that species have found a way to put their bits together, and when they do, right, they make light they make the most amazing experience possible. They have figured out how to become one from two distinct creatures. And when they do it, it changes their bodies, it changes their brains, it changes their emotions, and it provides them access to the most numinous states possible. Get a load of that. That's us. Like, we are absolute outliers. No other species does it quite the way we do. And when you really want to boil it down, we are prefrontal cortexes connected to spinal columns, connected to erogenous zones. And we have the capacity to sh take all that evolutionary impulse, all that urge to figure this out no matter what without an instruction manual, right? And we can use it to hotwire our own consciousness and being. If you just take a look at this map, right? We have the ability to shift our brain waves and our neural state. We have a vagus nerve, which runs from our, the base of our brainstem all the way down through our body to our root. We have an endocannabinoid system, which is the system inside our bodies. It's as old as sea sponges, but also happens to fit directly with cannabis. So anybody is familiar with that ubiquitous worldwide use of that plant. It's not because the plant is so magical. It's because through a, a luck of botany, Right? As Michael Pollan once said, he said, cannabis has, has soothed men's minds in order to borrow his feet. It came down out of the Tibetan plateau 23 million years ago and has been passed around the world and cultivated and grown simply because it plugs into this system, which does everything from stimulate stem cells to reduce brain inflammation, to regulate our autonomic nervous system, to bone density, to child, to child bonding with their mothers. 
and then all the way down finally to our erogenous zones, which as we said, in conjunction with our mouths and tongues and hands, has the highest concentration of nerve endings in our bodies. And what that allows us to do, right, is everything from defrag our nervous systems experiencing micro-PTSD, and we term that micro-PTSD as just kind of the bumps and scrapes and stresses of day-to-day -day living, not necessarily single event traumas, but kind of like what we've all experienced in the last couple of years, right, being cooped up, having our lives disrupted, spending too much time on screens, all of those kind of things, so it's just kind of the small accretions of the day-to-day. Right? But done well and cultivated, they can also help us address macro PTSD, the actual traumatic life events right, that hit us. And in fact, I was speaking with Rick Doblin, the uh, Harvard PhD, who's one of the leaders on MDMA and trauma uh, therapy and also drug approval in the US, but also across Europe. And we were at an event, and he was describing, he's like, yeah, these. MDMA studies that we're doing, so this is where patients suffering lifelong trauma are given that specific compound, uh, MDMA, and then guided through talk therapy to release some of their deepest traumas. And he said, look, he said the, the closest analog, the closest similar thing that we have found to this state that we're putting these patients into, which was high vasopressin, prolactin, serotonin, oxytocin, he said the closest thing we can find is the post-orgasmic state. And I was like, what? You mean you guys have spent 30 years and 100 million bucks jumping through all of these hoops? It's beautiful work, and God bless you for doing it, but like, how else might we get, get people to that exalted state known only to scientists as post-orgasmic, right? And is there a simpler way? So what can also lead to, right, is actually non-ordinary states, peak states, transcendent states. So if you think of this as the full spectrum of the land we're playing in, how do we defrag our nervous systems from the day to day? How do we actually go back into our bodies and our memories and our hearts and actually heal and integrate right, the hits we've taken along the way? And ultimately, how do we touch the numinous? How do we provide access to the beyond for inspiration? That's the roadmap that we're on. All right. So now we're going to... That's the, introduction and setup, but what I'd love to do now is kind of a speed round where you guys get to chat with each other, okay? So we're gonna do a series of three questions. These are all absolutely safe. So the question is simply challenge by choice. How sincere, how open, right? How honest do we wanna be with each other? And as I said, I mean challenge by choice. So if this is uncomfortable in any way, please just feel free to pause. But on the other hand, I'd like you to weigh that against how much jet fuel, fuel and calories did we all burn collectively to be here together this weekend? <laughs> Think of these as karmic carbon offsets, right? We came here, we came here for reasons. I flew halfway around the world to be standing in front of you guys today, gladly, right? So let's not phone it in and let's give ourselves permission to go big together, okay, in, in service of the container for this weekend. So please t turn to the person you know the least, but near you. So not just the buddy you sat down with. And you're going to get each get 90 seconds. So this is a speed round. Find your partners. Find your partners. You can be in groups of two is ideal. Three if you need it. If there's any orphans, raise your hand if you're an orphan. Orphans find other orphans. Make a family. So first question, first question is, my relationship to sexuality as a teenager was dot, 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 because dot, dot, dot. Now this could mean, it could be a range of didn't know, didn't think about it. It could be I inherited my family of origin or my cultural beliefs. It could be I was a rebel and zigged where everyone else was zagging. Who knows? It could be I read a beautiful book. It could be I logged into a funky site online. Who knows what it is? but just give a description of what was the imprint as you were coming into adolescence to f create your formative relationship to sexuality. Go. Okay, now we're ready for our second question. So eyes back up front, please. Eyes back up front. We're gonna keep banging through these. Prompt number two. 
This should be a fun one, which is my most healing or transformative experience with sexuality has been. And again, this doesn't have to be freaky deaky swinging from rafters. This could just be a loving touch that went no further. This could be an eyes on a tube train, right? Whatever it might have been, it could have been a first love, you name it. But what was my most healing or transformative experience with sexuality? Begin. All right, and then eyes up front for your final prompt. And I just want to preface this one, folks. What happens in Kaplankia stays in Kaplankia. Are you ready? Prompt number three, if, if I could live into a sexual or relational experience I have not yet had but yearn for, it would be. So this is just a thought experiment. No, one's, no one has to sign anything. This is a chance to actually own your curiosity, own your desire and experience. So if I could live into a sexual or relational experience I haven't yet had, but yearn for, it would be. Go. All right. Let's go ahead and bring this to a close. And what I would like to ask you now is to please thank your partners. So in whatever way, you can hug, you can shake hands, you can bow, whatever it would be, a gesture of appreciation for your companions. So now we're gonna get into part three, our final concluding session. And this is actually about what to do with this problematic situation, right? If we've just learned, A, how, how amoral evolution is, B, how wildly unique humans are in the animal kingdom up to and including our nearest primate cousins, the question is, is what do we do with that now? Right? What can we do with that to reinforce our healing, inspiration, and connection? So this is a quote by Napoleon Hill. He's a famous American, you know, what would I call him? Jesus, he's like a success guy from the 30s and 40s. And I put him up here not because he's some wild yogic adept. I put him up here because he is so mainstream and, and obvious. And even he who wrote that book, Think and Grow Rich, which inspired many people to do the Tony Robbins thing, right, is actually even he had to say, sex is by great odds the most intense and powerful of all mind stimuli. The road to genius leads to the development, control, and use of sex, love, and romance. Which, if you think about it, is actually completely congruent with all of the esoteric wisdom traditions, East and West. Which, if you dig underneath the covers of pretty much all of them, they all include some version of asexual yoga. You know, not widely shared, usually esoteric, usually the secret within the secret within the secret, but all reflecting the intense neurochemical relationship between sexuality, our nervous systems, our brains, hearts, and consciousness. So here is a recipe. How many folks are in long-term relationships? Please go ahead and raise your hand. Okay, raise, raise another hand if um, parents in the audience. Okay, so that's the sum bitch, isn't it? Right? We get the lust attraction phase just long enough for us to say I do and to have a little one on the way. And then all the fun stuff just tapers off into nothing. And then we experience bed death and the relentless crushing grind of being householders and trying to raise kids together. That is a raw deal. But there is actually a situation here where once we know what evolution is trying to do, we have the chance to reclaim it. And this, this is simple maths, but fundamentally, the frequency and intensity of your practice between partners actually charges up those polarities again like electromagnets. So if you think about these, you know, these, this little image here, right? this is just you know, metal wrapped in copper wires that if you run electricity through it, suddenly creates magnetism strong enough to lift a truck. You stop the practice, they power back down again. You start the practice, zip, they spin back up again. And you can have the most passion you can handle 
regardless of where we are in the arc of our relationships, and we can actually hotwire evolution. So this was actually a study that we conducted three years ago involving 10 couples over 12 weeks to actually test this. Because we was doing, I was doing all the neuroanthropological research. We were engaged in these practices and we're like, holy moly, if this can heal trauma better than the leading psychedelic therapies, which are being designated as breakthrough therapies because they're so powerful, and everyone on the planet has access to this, this might be a really key missing link. So we conducted basically a study on hedonic engineering. So this is, uh, this is basically the ways you can think of making use of our bodies and brains in service of the healing and inspiration we're looking for. So the first is, they're solo practices. You can do these by yourself at any time. You can be doing breath work, you can be doing body work, these are your yoga practices. This is anything that you can do individually. Then there are partner practices. There is anything where you need or it's helpful to have another person as a spotter or a helper. So if you think about time, like time massage, where someone is pulling traction on your joints and openings, if you're thinking about acro yoga or balance partner yoga, any of those kinds of things, right? Those are definitely more fun and more exploratory with a partner. And then there are couples practices, and those are the ones typically where there is emotional or physical intimacy involved, right? So that we can practice and explore sexual fitness within the bounds of a safe container. Now, in most countries, the notion of sexual doulas or sexual midwives or those kind of things is, is mm, it's usually in the gray zone. It's some, some of it is underground work. Some, in some countries, it's legal. In most situations, the safest, most accessible route is consenting partnership. So we just want to kind of point out for anybody that's not in a long-term relationship or is in between partners or whatever it might be, there's lots of things to be done in the solo and partner realm but that if you're going to engage the full spectrum of how we are wired up, having couples practices is an important piece of that. And here's the other thing, right? If there's anything in this protocol or the ways you can combine all this stuff that goes against moral, ethical, legal, cultural, religious, spiritual mandates or values for you, no worries. You just skip that option. And all you need to do is increase the duration or intensity of any of the other practices, okay? So we also wanted to study, does this work? And this is just deep nerds for anybody who's kind of into, interested in the science behind it, but we basically measured healing, inspiration, and connection. And we used the Johns Hopkins Mystical Experience Questionnaire to map peak states. We used a flow scale inventory to decide, how, so peak states is like how, you know, how much of the sacred or the sublime did I have access to or experience of? The flow state scale is how often did I find myself in the zone in an effortless, graceful feeling day to day. The communitas measures how connected did I feel to my partner, because if I don't, it's probably not worth the, the hassle, right? We use the intimacy of self and other scale, this IOS scale, which is just a series of Venn, Venn circles, like where are we? I'm over here, you're over there, we're not connected at all, we're overlapping a little, we're overlapping a lot, we're one. Right, so that's the kind of the way that that gets used. And then the PANAS scale, which is the positive, effective, positive and negative affect scale. Am I happier or sadder? Right, and why? And then finally, the catharsis measures. Am I healing my trauma? This is a self-administered variant on the global gold standard, the CAPS trauma scale, which assesses how, how banged up people are and how much we're carrying that. And then also resting heart rate variability, which is how much is my heart overnight actually showing healthy variants. Because when I'm scared, when I'm stressed, right, I just thump along like a little rabbit, bup, 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 and there's very little variability. When I'm healthy, when I'm centered, when I'm grounded, I have high variability. So these were the ways we wanted to actually put numbers and, and statistics, right, on measuring does any of this stuff work, which used to be the realm of Tantra in the East and sex magic in the West. But all of those bodies of knowledge tended to come with esoteric terms, crazy language, hidden instructions, and you couldn't really separate what was the mythology, we'll do this because some amazing supernatural thing might happen, versus what was just the technology. These are our bodies and brains, and these are how they work. So this is the protocol that the 10 couples went with for three months, 12 weeks. 
The first was 15 minutes daily of clitoral stimulation for the female practitioner and 15 minutes of partner yoga, including body work, right? Thai massage, percussion therapy, any forms of stretching, integration, spinal mobility, pelvic health, and basically, you know, joint awareness and alignment. And then checking how they did on their overnight HRV. The next was twice weekly, an hour each. So you think 15 minutes every day, and then twice a week, an hour, which included the same foundation, and then went into 30 minutes of exploratory sexuality and body work, 15 minutes of breath work, and then lying in a bed accompanying music, and then finally, once, week, once a week, typically a sort of Shabbat Sabbath practice, you can sort of pick your, pick your day, Friday through Sunday, and have two hours of the whole shebang. So that would be all of the things that we've done before, including hyperventilation, breath work, and even gas-assisted breath work. So you're not just breathing air, you're actually combining carbon dioxide, oxygen, and nitrous oxide in various combinations accompanying physical erotic stimulation to potential climax with music. So now you can kind of see how all of these things combine together. And then finally, sort of, you know, galactic couch surfing, AKA Shavasana. So afterwards, afterwards, just kind of lying there with music, with breath, with body awareness, noticing what arises. And, oh, yes, once a month, full send. So that's when you have your favorite functional medical doctor and you can layer in um, oxytocin, ketamine, nasal spray, and or other compounds, which you can get, these are scheduled three, four, or available by prescription or pharmacy, um, cannabinoids, edibles, and or um, puffables, so that you can activate the endocannabinoid system, and you can put yourselves in state to then steer each other. So um, these are all the components. That was the baseline. We then basically gave everybody a, a recipe, and I think you're probably going to want to see these things, so I'll just say, we said we took a look at, hey, nitric oxide um, is a beautiful neurotransmitter, crosses the blood-brain barrier, exists through our bodies, and it is, generally speaking, conducive with health, well-being, and access or transition from stressful states into peak states. And Herbert Benson at Harvard University has done a ton of work on this, as well as others. There's vagal nerve tone, which we've just been discussing, and I'm sure that Gabor and others will be unpacking maybe some of this in more detail, but a core metronome to our physical health. There's endorphins and dopamine. How do we access and boost those? There's oxytocin, which we've discussed as sort of, you know, both pair bonding as well as mother-child relationships, closeness and intimacy. Testosterone, a predominant driver of sex hormones. Psychoactives, which we were just referring to, kind of layering it on. Trauma and respiration. So if you basically take a look, mild, medium, spicy is you, you get to choose how you want to influence these things. But you can basically just do boost nitric oxide by eating healthier stuff. And I'm sure Mark has all kinds of recommendations on that. But beets, pumpkin seeds, those kinds of things, healthy nitric oxide boosters. Supplements, concentrates, right, that actually have high dose beet, beet concentrate or others in it. All the way up to um, ED drugs like uh, um, Viagra and Cialis, right, which will boost access and release. So the vasodilation that results, which is why those drugs work, is because of the increased unlocking of nitric oxide. Vagal nerve tone you can increase by throat massage and vocalization. So humming, singing, gagging, right, any of those things as well as manipulation and massage increases vagal nerve tone. Um, if you actually want to come at it from the other direction, and this is just, sorry, nature's efficient, right? We tend to have multi-use orifices, but actually anal plugs or stimulation can engage the pelvic floor and also stimulate the vagal nerve from the root. You then go into medical devices. So there are actually almost like little pacemakers that you can use to stimulate the vagal nerve tone and boost things that way. Endorphins and dopamine right, is both pain response as well as novelty and sensation, so simple sensation play. If anybody has looked into like a sex positive store and kind of looked at their sort of toolkit or toy boxes, they actually have an awful lot of overlap with um, occupational therapists who work with kids with sensory integration disorders, feathers, pinwheels, weighted blankets, all of these kinds of things that just say, hey, we are disembodied heads on sticks can we actually reintegrate our nervous systems and our sensation right, in ways that is fun, exploratory, and integrative? 
Next um, is simple. I mean, this sounds way done. Okay. Well, how about this? I'm just going to bang through this. This is the this is the recipes. You can take a look at these. And for anybody that is interested, um, we can actually do like a lunchtime gathering um, potentially tomorrow. Um, if anybody would like to get into the actual practicals and how-tos, um, because the trauma work can actually become quite powerful, which is as you put yourself in these states, we're now in that neck of the woods where the PTSD therapy began, and you can actually both process your own biographical trauma, um, either in the relationship itself or historic from before you were together. You can also get into all men, all women, and actually begin working with some of those things. They typically just kind of arise as they arise. It's less intentional. And then you can also get into straight out transpersonal experience, where we're now into the realm of the mysteries. And you have access to different entities, deities, beings, possibility spaces. So just know that these three can move pretty, um, pretty beautifully. And that can start with breathing together. They can start with more dynamic breath patterns like Lisa was sharing, and it can go all the way to gas-assisted, breath holds and breath work. So I'm going to bang through this, but moral of the story is it worked, right? And over 12 weeks, across all those features, everything went up, trauma went down, peak experiences were the highest, especially for the women, of any experience they'd had in their lives, and it outperformed talk therapy and psychedelic therapy. So just think about that for a moment, that we have possibilities to heal ourselves to access the highest heights and to be more connected, more passionate, and more engaged with the people that we love the most, that we've invested the most in, that we're raising families, that we're living lives, and that we're hopefully showing up to play our parts. So this is the access to God consciousness. Supersaturate your body and brains with dopamine, endorphins, nitric oxide, oxytocin, and serotonin. Optimize your endocannabinoid system and your vagal nerve tone. And train your brain out of beta wave states, what we're all using to listen to each other, into deep alpha and then theta and then all the way down into delta, which is basically the closest you get to a near-death experience while still being alive. Right? Reset your brain stem right? using molecules like nitrous oxide and ketamine. And then pulse energy through that primate nervous system of ours. Right? And light up all of our circuits move and align in a full kind of yoga capacity, breathe intentionally to upregulate or downregulate what you're doing, crank righteous tunes, right? Bangers are absolutely appropriate here because they are actually the carrier wave of your consciousness and experience, and take that ride. Do not give in to astonishment. Know that it can actually deliver you outside of time and space, and then remember what we're here to do. Remember what we've forgotten and commit to doing it. So that's it, really. There, this is, these are arguably the first time that the esoteric technologies of sexual tantra and or sex magic have been expressed in contemporary 21st century Western terms with paint-by-numbers tools to allow us all access to these things. And, and what I would hope is that um, we can take this as our birthright. And that as we had this conversation with each other and we all learned both how unique our own answers to those questions were and also how shared and universal they are, that we can reclaim our birthright as not just homo sapiens, right, the ape who knows, but homo ludens, right, the ape who plays. And, and, to, and to leave, if, I, you know, if you leave with nothing else, it's that notion from the Beatles, right? And in the end, the love you take is equal to the love we make. Thank you very much.